Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidi musini nebiyyine Muhammed Ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmaîn ve azkullah subhanahu wa ta'ala That he grants us tawfiq and success and he keeps us safe from all forms of fitan And that he purifies us with the best of purifying and he allows us to keep away from sins And that which brings his displeasure and anger And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us at the forefront of obeying him and seeking his pleasure and his mercy in the dunya and the akhir. Uh, this is the second session where we are looking at the books Athar Ma'asi and al Fadi Wal Mujtama, the ill effects of the sins that a person commits on himself as well as in society. And this is part of a khutbah that was given by Sheikh Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than 30 years ago, rahimahullah. And we began looking at this khutbah which has been written uh, in Arabic it's been transcribed and it's also been translated because of the benefit behind the, the khutbah and in the first khutbah we looked at how the Sheikh Rahimahullah was talking about how sins have an impact and before that actually he talked about the Qadr of Allah and he said Rahimahullah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only decrees what is just and Whatever we do out of goodness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward it. And this is from His justice and His mercy. <coughs> and whatever bad that we experience, either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us, or it could be part of the qadr of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing us. And this is how He begins the khutbah by saying that your actions have an impact. Then, rahimahullah, He talked about how sins can have an impact on a person individually and the ummah as a whole how he said rahimahullah that because of your sins you will be overcome and from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's not going to punish us in one go like what's happened to the nations that came before this is part of the dua that the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had for us as a ummah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejected the dua of the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he supplicated that we do not turn against one another. And the Shaykh is saying here, we would only end up turning against one another as a count of our sins. And that's the summary of the first khutbah. Now in the second khutbah, rahimahullah, he talks about sins as an effect on a person, individually, as ummah, as a whole. But here, he is talking about something which is a little bit different compared to the first khutbah. And this is to be expected from the ahkam of giving the khutbah is that the khatib, the person who's delivering the khutbah has to be precise in what he is saying and he needs to avoid repetition. So in the second khutbah he's going to talk about the same topic but adding benefits and talking it from a different perspective. So he begins the second khutbah by praising Allah and bearing the witness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and testifying that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger and then he says Amma ba'd now here there's a fiqhi point the difference of opinion between the madhahib as to what is the bare minimum of a khutbah some of the scholars and this is well known from the Hanafi madhab as long as a person stands on the mimbar and he gives them some kind of a reminder even if it is very brief then the khutbah has been completed so imagine if the khatib just gets up there and he says fear Allah Giving sadaqah. Allah loves for those people to give in sadaqah. Sufficient, even if it's just a few words. But with the Shafi'iyah and the Hanabila, and this is one of the views from the Hanabila, is that the khutbah has to have five aspects to it. Otherwise, the khutbah will be deficient or it could even be nullified. The first one is that the person begins by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second one, he sends he bears witness to the oneness of Allah and bears witness <coughs> that Muhammad is his finest slave and his messenger and we looked at the evidence for this last week and this is how the khutbah then should begin the third one is that he advises people to have the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what that basically means is that the khutbah must have a message and this is what you find here, what the Shaykh is saying in the first khutbah and now after he has completed the introduction by praising Allah and bearing witness to his oneness and bearing witness to Muhammad being the final slave and messenger and it is quite lengthy if you go back to it 
you can read it for yourselves. Then he says, Amma Ba'd, he says, uh, O servants of Allah, fear Allah. And this is what I'm trying to say from the ahkam, is that these ulama have said that you need to encourage the audience to fear Allah, and this is part of the khutbah. However, even if he doesn't do that, there needs to be a message. There needs to be a message which is going to benefit them, which is going to encourage them to fear Allah. Because remember, we've done this before, the fear of Allah is where a person does what is good, and he stays away from what is bad. That's basically taqwa. So even if he doesn't directly say fear Allah, taqwa Allah, or something like that, as long as the khutbah is delivering a message which is encouraging them to do good deeds and staying away from bad ones, then that third part of the, the khutbah, that third pillar of the khutbah with the Shafi and the Hanabila has been met. And then they say the fourth one, he needs to send peace and blessings upon the Prophet and from the evidence is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ And we have raised your mention. And some of the companions, Abu Hurairah and others, have said, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ Meaning, we have elevated your mention during the khutbah. So the khatib should encourage people to send peace and blessings upon the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's the fourth aspect. And then the fifth aspect is to make dua. And now they have said that the du'a should be something which is connected to the topic that they have obviously delivered. If he is talking about one thing and then he makes supplications for something which is unrelated, I mean, it doesn't affect the validity, but what they have said, they have encouraged that if he is talking about zakat, he asks Allah to make them the people of zakat. If he has talked about salah, he makes them people who establish it, etc. But the key aspect of making du'a is that that du'a should be for the Muslims and the Muslim ummah. So now, going back to the khutbah, he begins by advising the listeners and now the readers uh, to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, exact, he actually explains what fear of Allah actually is. So he says, beware of neglecting the prescribed laws of Allah and falling into what is forbidden. Then he moves on to the actual topic itself. So that's an introduction to the second khutbah, which is encouraging to fear Allah, but it's not really connected, but it is kind of but not directly connected to the topic, which is the ill effects of sin. So he says now, Ibadullah, servants of Allah. In this second khutbah, he is talking about the effects of sins on us as individuals and us as a community. But in the second khutbah, rahimahullah, he actually talks about what could happen to us as individuals and the community if we stop advising one another. Remember in the first khutbah, he was talking about the qadr of Allah, he was talking about the consequences, he was talking about how we would then end up turning against one another, having hasid for one another, ghiba, etc., and not having any kind of unity as a count of our sins. That's the summary of the first khutbah. In the second one, he is talking about the same sort of thing, but he is saying here now, if you do not repent from your sins and do not change your ways, what this will then create is a bad and a toxic environment where people will not care for one another. There are some people who doubt and seek to cause doubt that sins are cause of misfortunes. Similar to what he said in the first khutbah. Meaning, some people say that the calamities that we experience, whether that's individual or communal, some people say, oh, it's not because of your sins, it's because there's a war in Ukraine, or there is Brexit, or whatever else. He is saying here, this is because of a weakness in their iman and the negligence on them reflecting on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will recite for you to benefit such people who have this saying, who have this idea. And he extensively recites a number of ayat, rahimahullah. And this was his habit, Muthaymin rahimahullah. And these ayat are taken from Surah Al-A'raf 96 to 99. Walau anna qura amanu had the people of the, the village, meaning Mecca, believed, had they believed and had taqwa, we would have opened up the blessings from the skies and the earth, world. or rather they rejected. I mean, this ayah here is sufficient. He carries on with the next ayat, and there's a whole... Uh, paragraph, if you like, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about the effects of sins, but this is sufficient. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, those people, they disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Ahlul Qura. And because of that, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withheld from them barakat from the sama and the art. So in the end of that, we're like in they disbelieve, فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ So we took them because of their sins, because of what they used to do. أَفَأَمِنَ أَهْلُ الْقُرَانِ يَأْتِيهُمْ بَأْسُنَا بَيَاتُمُهُمْ نَائِمُونَ And the ayat continue. And that is for something, inshallah, for you to go back to. But I think, like I said, that's sufficient. Then he said, rahimahullah, one of the pious salaf, one of the salaf al he said, if you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granting blessings to a certain person, now this is really important. A person might think, okay, well, I know a lot of people who are sinful. They've got big houses, they've got designer clothes, they've got money in the bank balances, and their fridges are full. How is it possible this point is related to what I actually see in society. You're saying that sins have an effect on you. You're saying if you are sinful, that should cause difficulty. But I don't see that. One of the Sufis Salih, he said, Rahimahullah, if you see Allah granting blessings to a particular person, and you see that person continuing in disobedience with all of those blessings, the dunya has been made open to him, but he continues to be disobedient, know that this is known as something which is called al-istidraj. And in the English translation here it says, Allah's plan against him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-A'raf again, سَنَسْتَدْرِجُهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَعْنَمُونَ Meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows this person to continue. Isn't that what happened with Fir'aun? Isn't that what happened with the leaders of Quraysh? Wouldn't that happen with... All these people, Iblis himself, continue. Continue in your dunya, continue in your corruption, continue in your fasad, in the Arabic terminology and the English one. وَأُمْلِي لَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I grant them respite, إِنَّ كَيْدِي مَتِي My plot is strong until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes them and his taking is severe, subhanahu. So don't think, the Shaykh is saying here, don't think that a person's sins doesn't have an impact on calamities. It does. And if you do see a person who's having a very good life but being disobedient at the same time, then you should recognize as a believer that this person is being tested by the very thing that he loves. O Muslims, O worshippers of Allah, by Allah, sins affect the security of a land. They affect its ease, its prosperity, its economy. And they affect the hearts of its people, Allahu Akbar. Sins affect everything, including your heart. Sins cause, alien, sins cause alienation between the people. I mean, this is similar to what we said last week. Sins cause one Muslim to regard his Muslim brother as if he was on a separate religion altogether. I understand. But if we sought to rectify ourselves, our families, our neighbours, and those in our area, in our community, and everyone we are able to rectify, meaning you try your best to rectify yourself, and whoever you are able to have a positive influence on, if we mutually encouraged good and forbade evil, and we assisted in those things which are beloved to Allah with wisdom, then this would produce unity and harmony. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٍ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَلَى الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِهُونَ There should be a group of you from this ummah who call towards good and they advise and they prevent what is bad. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِهُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, those are the successful ones. Put a stop to this in yourself. Meaning, you enjoin good and forbid evil in yourself first. And then your family. And then those people who you're close to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called this and described this what? وَلَيْكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِهُونَ Next ayah. وَلَا تَكُونُ كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا Do not be like those people who differed. Differ, account of what? Not enjoining good and forbidding evil. Allowing sins to occur. This person is doing, ah, oh, he's alright. He's a good guy in his heart. It's up to him. God will judge him. I tried, but he doesn't listen. Then this will cause differing. And the proof has come to them, but they still differed. For those people, lahum adamun adim. An awful torment. I call myself and you, for he's taking his own advice, my brothers, to come together upon the deen of Allah, support one another in establishing the sharia of Allah, advise one another sincerely with wisdom, 
and debate with those people who need to be debated with in the best possible way by satisfying them with textual proofs and intellectual proofs and do not abandon the people of false beliefs upon their falsehood, meaning from this Muslim Ummah. You see your brother upon whatever he's upon. And remember, we said this last week as well, that people will fall into sin and deviation because of one or two things, or maybe even both. Shubuhat and shahawat, confusion and doubts in the aqeedah, not being satisfied that this is actually the religion of truth, or shahawat because of their desires. The Sheikh is saying here, if you find people upon that falsehood, don't leave them to it. Since they have a right upon us, this is a haqq that they have upon you, that we should explain to them the truth and encourage them to follow it. But as for remaining disunited and having no regard for one another, not caring for your Muslim brother and sister, then whoever does not care about the Muslims, then he is not from them. O Muslims, I say and repeat that it is binding upon us being Muslims and believers that we see the occurrences and misfortunes from the Islamic perspective as shown by the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. What is that? That we are going through what we are going through, weaknesses ourselves and as a community because of our sins. Since if we look at them from a materialistic perspective, then the disbelievers are stronger and greater than us. So now the Shaykh is saying here, and this is connected to what he said in the first khutbah, the kuffar are physically stronger than us, economically stronger than us. Uh, they've got technological advancements. I mean, you can name it, and you will see that there is no real comparison between where we are and them. Does that mean that they are superior to us? The Sheikh is saying here, if a person was to look at it from a dunyawi perspective, then you would think that they are better than us. However, if we look at it from an Islamic perspective by the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and we abandoned all that is a cause of these misfortunes, meaning our sins, and we return back to Allah and the religion of Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, and he is the most truthful in speech and most capable, وَلِيُنْصُرُنَّ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَوِيٌ عَزِيزٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help those who help in his cause, subhana. And truly Allah is all strong and mighty. الَّذِينَ يَمَكِّنَّهُمْ فِرْضِ Those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives authority in the land. أَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ They now are eradicating themselves from sins. They are establishing the salat. They establish the salat, they give the zakat, they enjoy what is good, and they forbid what is bad. And all of the end results rests with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Shaykh is saying here, these ayat are actually showing us that those people who establish the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them authority on the land. And he did not say, those whom we give them power on earth, establish arenas of sin and idol, idleness and shamelessness. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, we give authority to those people who establish the salah and the zakah and the end of the ayat. He says here now, consider carefully, O my Muslim brother, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said he will help those who will help him. He stressed this promise of help with terms of emphasis because here now we have the lamb of emphasis and the noon with the shadda and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasized it even more by ending the ayah surely Allah is strong and almighty since by his power and his might he helps those whom he wills Consider how these ayat end. The last one, وَلِلَّهِ الْعَاقِبَةُ الْأُمُورِ The Shaykh is saying here, there's proof after proof in just these two ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surely, without any doubt, establish those people who relieve themselves from sins on the earth. So a person might now say, and he says a person with faulty thinking might say, how can we be aided and granted victory against disbelieving nations who are stronger and more powerful than us? A person might even then say, added to that, I mean, I'm not sure if the Sheikh actually will address this later, but a person might even then say, well, if we're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant authority on the earth, it must mean that these people are better. 
because Allah has given them authority. Hopefully the Shaykh will answer both of these queries in the same response. So Allah the Most High subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that the affairs are under his control and that he has power over everything. We all know what effect earthquakes have occurring when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered. He says, Kun fayakun, be and it will become. And such a huge and all-embracing destruction occurs in a single second and it cannot be produced by any one of the strongest nations. What is he meaning by this? What he is saying here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change your situation in a matter of moments, in a matter which is unexpected, you can't even see it coming. All he needs to say is kun and it becomes. But with this also, and this is now towards the end of the khutbah anyway, but with this also with the second shubha, with the second doubt, the ulama have said, if you have two groups of sinful people, these people are weak and these people are weak, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow those who are materialistically stronger to overcome the other. Because now all of them are doing it for the sake of the dunya. If you've got two people, one person living for the sake of the dunya and the other person living for the sake of the dunya, what's going to happen? Their affair is going to be dealt with in the dunya. But if you've got one group of people, and this is what the point the Sheikh is making here, as an ummah, if we all purified ourselves, went back to the religion of Allah as he is saying here, and worked for the akhirah, even if it was 300 against 1,000 as we have seen, what happened in the end result? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather them as the authority on earth. There is no doubt, and we have seen this happen. But if we leave the religion of Allah, khalas, that's it. You get sorted amongst yourselves. By Allah, he says, rahimahullah, if we truly aided Allah's deen, as we ought to, then we would be granted victory over every enemy upon earth. But unfortunately, many of our enemies, many of our weaknesses and the victory of our enemies over us from the enemies of Allah and the enemies of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, is because of the fact that we have left observing the actions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Messenger have told us to follow. Perhaps even going to their lands, now here look at this, he says perhaps some of the Muslims have even gone to their lands, he said this 30 years ago so it needs a bit of context, but he said perhaps going to their lands and throwing our own flesh and blood, meaning our sons and our daughters, into their lands where nothing is heard except for church bells. No other, no mention of the name of Allah is heard and nothing is seen except sin and idleness. And this is precisely what we're seeing in society today. And on a smaller scale, throw them into school, same thing, throw them into college, the workplace, wherever else might be. So we ask Allah the Most High that He turns the misguided of this Ummah back to guidance and that He makes us all support one another so that we can communally carry out good and righteousness until we return to this Ummah, its lost glory and honour. Indeed, Allah is able to do all things. And then He continues by making dua, like we said. The nature of the dua is where the Shaykh, I mean, there's a lot of repetition in the dua anyway where he was making du'a for the Muslim Ummah and then he actually completes the khutbah with one of the things that we said earlier which is to send peace and blessings upon the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam This completes the small treaties on, on this matter uh, We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to mercy on the Shaykh and that he places on this scale of good deeds Yawm Qiyamah and that he makes it as a means of goodness for the Muslim Ummah and that whoever hears it then he makes us of those who hear and follow in goodness Next week, inshallah, as we are all aware, you've probably seen on the screens, every single day after Salat al Isha, we've got um, a book that we are covering. So that's Monday to Thursday. And I actually anticipate that Thursday's class will be then split over Thursday and Friday because the text is actually quite long. So our next Friday session, uh, as we go through the books of Sheikh Muhammad, Muthaymin, will actually probably be on the 30th. 
unless if the 30th there is another conference somewhere, that might be cancelled. If not, then on the 6th, inshallah. And the next book, as has been suggested by one of the uncles, should be something in Aqeedah. So what we will do is Lum'atul Ittiqad by Ibn Qudama, uh, the Illuminating Creed by Ibn Qudama, with the explanation of Sheikh Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a very good book. It's very basic in explaining what the Aqeedah of the Muslim should be. And it highlights some of the most important things that the Muslim should believe in, obviously with the commentary and explanation of Sheikh Muhammad. It is more extensive than some of the things that we have done before, so it probably will run for a longer period of time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us all tawfiq and success. Allahu a'ala wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.